Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Dan Alvarez. I am an owner and chief, belt, chief business development officer for Synergy Settlement Services. Um, grateful to have this time to share and share some of our expertise from some of our a panel of experts. Um, before getting into the education, I'd like to talk just briefly about the why of what Synergy is. Synergy was an organization founded to allow trial lawyers to focus on being trial lawyers. And, and what Synergy is passionate about is, among other things, that there's, there's one way in which the civil justice system is somewhat broken, right? And as a previous uh, trial lawyer, I can attest to that fact. You as the trial lawyer, you and your firm do all the work, you spend all the money, you take on all the risk, you do the entire fight, and the minute you have a win for a family that so badly deserves it, everybody comes with their hands out trying to get at that recovery. And Synergy was an organization founded to protect the recoveries that you work so hard for on behalf of the families that so badly deserve them. And, and plain and simple, that is what we do, what we're passionate about, why we were founded, and what we celebrate. Um, today's uh, is an opportunity for us to share some of our experiences and, and some things that work and some things that don't. Um, our goal, uh, as you know, this is a free webinar. So... Um, we're not in the education business. We're sharing our experience and expertise in an effort to earn the opportunity to be your expert partner. And at Synergy, we would love the chance to talk more about how uh, we can be an extension of your law firm that can handle these issues and allow you to fo focus on being trial lawyers and focus on capturing these recoveries and having an expert partner on the back end of the case that can work very hard to protect it. Uh, brief agenda for the day. We're going to start with Attorney Teresa Kenyon. Uh, presenting on advanced strategies for lien resolution, followed by attorney Michael Walrath presenting on uh, winning techniques to reduce hospital liens. Our third session is attorney Rasa Fumagali presenting on Medicare secondary compliance, um, addressing futures, conditional payments, and Medicare Advantage liens. And finally, my partner, attorney Jason Lazarus, uh, will cover ethical issues in government benefit preservation. Um, each of those sessions is going to run somewhere between 30, 40 minutes. At the conclusion of all four sessions, we'll have a Q&A and a, and a live Q&A with a panel to address any case-specific questions you have. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Teresa for the Advanced Strategies for Lean Resolution. And Teresa, I ask that you just briefly uh, intro yourself. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, so I am the director of the Lean Resolution Department. And... This here is my bio slide. So um, I've been with Synergy about two years now. Prior to joining Synergy, I worked at the Rawlings Company, and I was there for eight, nine years um, as associate general counsel. So I know a lot of the tricks of the trade as it as it relates to Rawlings, and um, really how it can transfer over to a lot of the other um, lien holders as well. I've got a team of experts that I coach and mentor on a regular basis, and we have our primary focus is getting the biggest reduction possible on every one of these liens so that those funds, those settlement funds can stay in the injured party's pocket. So for today, we are going to talk about lien resolution. Um, in general, but also some early prep work that you can do when you're settling your case that might help either your office or Synergy as your expert partner in reducing the liens. I'm going to show some slides with um, lien statements from various companies and some issues that we often see with those that are issues that you should fight and not just um, allow the lien holder to, to pull these kind of tactics. Um, we're going to talk about the recovery vendors, so the Rawlings and Optums um, and the the other ones that are trying to take those settlement funds. And then really just as far as content, I'm just going to focus on ERISA and military liens for today. Um, Rasa will be following me with the Medicare liens and Michael with the hospital liens. So we're, you're going to get a lot of lien um, kind of stuff throughout this session. All right, so let's talk about lien resolution. So the, the case after the case. Um, so what does it take to resolve? Uh, the first the first part, really, when you're thinking about resolving a lien is that you've got to identify who the lien holders are. You've got to identify who is actually interested in these funds. Um, a lot of times that question turns into like, well, do they have a right? Do I need to notify them? Uh, do they need to reach out to me first? There's just lots of those kind of questions that, that take place. 
um, Synergy's position is going to be that you should notify all of them. If they don't have a right, then you should tell them they don't have a right and close that door. Otherwise, that door is open a little bit and then you're done and it's not just the case after the case, but you've moved on to the next case and then this case sneaks back in and you've got an upset client that is knocking on your door because they got a letter from the Rawlings company or they're getting phone calls from um, Optum or something else is happening with their benefits that their future claims are no longer being paid. So Teresa, you do for, wanna... forgive, forgive the brief interruction um, yes. as, as the moderator. Um, I don't know if you're giving a lengthy uh, summary or if you're attending to move through the slides, but the slides aren't moving. Uh, so if you're referencing them, we're, we're still looking at your cover. So I just want to give you a heads up. All right. Thank you. Thank Very you. Um, yes, um, we should be we should be looking at other slides. So um, Synergy at Synergy, we're experts in a lot of things and we're still perfecting our IT day to day. So Definitely. Well, I do want the slides to be shown because otherwise. Um, oh, I see why there you have to you have to put it on air instead of um, having it just be paused so um, all right learn as we go okay so um, so how do you find out what the coverage is that's often um, something that you ask your client on the front end when you are intaking um, ask them who's covered the medical bills but sometimes that's not that's not an easy answer to receive um, that's that's not a, an easy question to ask and then get an accurate answer. Sometimes they'll tell you it's one thing and it turns out it was actually two or three different um, companies that may have covered the medical bills. Um, anytime you can get copies of insurance card for your file, that definitely helps synergy with moving forward with the lien resolution process. And then the other big key is to look at medical bills or ex ex explanation of benefits that might list um, an insurance company. Sometimes though that's really generic. It might just say like insurance adjustment or um, contract insurance payment and um, perhaps a phone call to the hospital or provider helps you find out um, who the interested parties might be. Um, the next thing that you really want to focus on when it when it comes to resolving a lien is, is what's what's the law? Where does the law come from for this particular interested party to be coming up to the table and trying to take money from the settlement fund. Uh, it could be a statutory right that they have. Um, so that's going to be more of your Medicare, Medicaid, military, um, some hospital. Um, could be contractual, which is going to be more of your ERISA liens, um, perhaps even a non-ERISA lien, like a city, county, or state employer plan, um, FEBA, those kind of things. And then you need to know if it's a state law or federal law that you are um, going to be governed by, that you're going to be fighting this lien holder with. Um, so having a, a good understanding of who it is that you're looking at and then what laws they should be subject to is definitely the first step to, to resolving the lien. Um, next, you're going to want to know what equitable arguments are present in your case that might carry some weight. So. Um, as we know, all personal injury cases have a have a sad factor to them. It had, there's a person that's been injured, sometimes catastrophically, sometimes minorly, but nonetheless, this is all a, a big inconvenience to the injured party. Um, again, whether it be a minor inconvenience because they had to go to some physical therapy and, and then they're completely back on their feet or a major life inconvenience that has completely devastated them and their family. But all of those things, whether or not the plan, uh, the medical benefit provider actually has to take those things into consideration or not, it's still part of the story. It's part of the narrative that ultimately gets you where you need to go. So for Synergy, when we are looking at reducing a lien, we're definitely looking for mediation briefs, um, copies of demands or complaints that have that, that level of detail but not just for us to learn the story, but it also helps to have it in writing as you're presenting that story to the lien holder. So it's not just that I'm saying it now, but that it's been part of the case all the way along. And we'll talk about that, I believe, on the next slide as well. And then finally, what does it take to resolve a lien? From the Synergy perspective, hiring an expert. It is what we do all day, every day, as I indicated on the the previous slide that you all didn't see. Um, my team is um, doing this day in and day out. A lot of the team, just like me, comes from the other side, from the various companies that we interact with on a regular basis. And so there's just a lot of extra insight that a partner like Synergy can have um, to help get the lien 
resolved as much as possible. All right, so early lien preparation during your case. So a lot of times we will receive a lien after the case is settled. And sometimes when that happens, there are certain things where it's like, oh, if only we were able to advise you to do this or to take this position or get that in writing, uh, then it would make the actual reduction of the lien easier. So whether you come to Synergy with the lien for our help with resolving or whether you're doing it in in-house, really thinking about the lien while you're settling the case, while you're building your case is certainly an important piece that a lot of times seems like it gets left out because that lien is the case after the case. It's not your primary focus. Um, so this is just trying to highlight that, let it be a little bit of the focus um, as you are settling the underlying case. So um, difficulties in the case. So we all know that there could be liability issues, there could be causation issues, um, pre-existing medical history, maybe it's been exacerbated by the loss, uh, failure to diagnose is um, a, a big thing, medical malpractice cases, like all of those can have like actual difficulties that lien holders just don't seem to understand. And to just try to verbally tell them and get them to understand is sometimes difficult. But if you have something in writing from the underlying case, it can, it can definitely help kind of lay that foundation for the arguments that you're trying to make. So in that way, things that we've seen be helpful in the past, a letter from the carrier that you're dealing with or defense counsel, um, some kind of email communications during the negotiations that are actually highlighting the difficulties that you're now trying to argue when you're trying to get the lien reduced. Um, so just something in writing and that, that indicates that there was some kind of struggle about X subject, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, obviously, if there's an IME that's been done, that can be helpful as far as a, a cutoff date or uh, further like written explanation on what was considered as part of the settlement and what was not considered as part of the settlement because that relatedness of claims is often a big negotiating factor to actually get that lien amount right to truly begin extra negotiations to get it reduced. Um, medical records that show the pre-existing condition. So this is often a, it's a difficult one because you might not have the pre-records. You might only have records from the data loss on. But sometimes for these lien holders, if you're able to present medical records showing that this person has had prior neck trauma for two years prior to this loss, that can be something that actually helps get them on board and helps them understand. Deposition testimony, so if it's if it's been part of the questioning and they've talked about the liability issues, the medical issues, the causation and pre-existing, like any of those kind of things, if it's in writing, it helps these lien holders have a better understanding. Um, and it's not just, it doesn't come off as if you're just trying to say it to get the reduction, it's actually part of the case. Um, same thing with mediation briefs. So that's something that you've obviously submitted as part of the case. It makes it a little bit more real. And that's that's really the goal with, with all of these um, particular things. Um, economic reports, life care plans, all of those things that are um, indicating future issues um, that the injured party is going to have can also help um, because you, you're, you're using it for getting the underlying settlement and then it also can, can assist with the reduction because it's showing the whole picture, and that's really what all, what all these things are trying to do. Um, so I, I covered a lot of this, but um, the issues to document your date ranges of, of medical treatment, so that's where the IME can show that. Um, if there's emails where they're saying, no, we think your person has reached you know, maximum improvement as of this date, any of those kind of things that are in writing, the liability issues, so if there were um, fights and discussions about um, how much of uh, of the case they were willing to accept, that they were saying that your person was 40% at fault. If, if something like that is in writing in some place, that can be super helpful. And then um, with those pre-existing conditions, if if they are specifically not considering something, if you, if you just have an email chain that, that shows that they are completely not accepting that the knee was related to the loss and they're only accepting the ankle, then, then that can be helpful to get those claims off of the lien holder statements. 
All right, so when you're reviewing the lien claim statement, this is um, the document that you're getting. And, and at this point, I'm talking very generally about all liens. So we've got the Medicare CPL. Um, there's the Rawlings Excel spreadsheet that's got all the breakdown for things. Um, and I've got some clips here of, of the various ones for Optum and Equian and Conduent. Um, and they all look a little different and they all have a little bit of different information. Um, I'm biased, I guess, towards the Rawlings one because it's the one I was most familiar with for so many years. But I do compare that one to a lot of the other lien holder um, claim statements that seem like they're missing some information that they should have access to, to putting on there, which is helpful for you actually verifying and validating that their lien is accurate and something that they should even be asserting. Unfortunately, a lot of these things can be manipulated. Um, as much as these companies try to have systems and processes in place, there are still human hands on a keyboard that can get in there and change things. Um, and that's, it's unfortunate, but this is where if you take a closer look and if you're really familiar with the bills themselves and what should be there, you can maybe catch some of these things um, to make sure that they're staying honest. So unfortunately that, that can be a thing. Um, so treatment dates, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that the treatment dates are broken down and not a lump sum. So sometimes you'll see that somebody was in the hospital for four days and it'll be a, a bill of, 150,000 and a payment of 75,000 and you have no idea what happened for that amount of money. So you want to demand that breakdown and get them to show all of the days in a broken down way. The health plan received it in a broken down way. This is just the vendor who's choosing to relay it to you in a um, lump sum kind of way. So billing codes, um, you don't want just a generic ICD code, you want the CPT code as well, which is the procedure code. Um, a lot of times that ICD code is marked when they're at the hospital, when they're in a doctor's office, and they might mark all kinds of things that the person has as their history, but it's the procedure code that lets you know exactly what it is that's occurred. So if someone shows up and they've had, have a history of back and neck and diabetes and all other kinds of things that are not related, it might be back that is the primary ICD code, but then if you look at that procedure code, you see that it's a diabetes test. You see that it's lab work that's completely unrelated to what the case is actually about. A lot of these claim summaries don't include that CPT code, and that's a big problem uh, for me, so it should be a big problem for you as well. Uh, provider names shouldn't be missing. A lot of times that field is just empty. Um, and really you wanna make sure that it's matching your records. Um, can be a little confusing though. You might not have the individual like ER physician, um, perhaps a different doctor was used in the billing than the one that actually provided the treatment. But the big key is to make sure that there's not a blank in that box. The build amount, um, a lot of times you'll see a build amount on a claim summary that shows zero. And then there'll be a paid amount that shows $50,000 question that. That's a problem. Um, sometimes you'll see a build amount of $800, but a payment of $1,200. If, if anything is not matching up with your own records or just doesn't make sense, you've got to question those things. Um, the way that these lien holders put these together, they're doing it quickly and they're just building their lien. And unfortunately, once that lien is created, it is a, a difficult matter for them to then remove the claims. Um, but these are the kind of things that you want to be pointing out to them and making them do their job, so to say, um, to get to get it right, because this is definitely important. So this is just an example of an optum lien. Um, I've highlighted here some things that are just thrown on here and very obviously unrelated or would be considered their pre-existing condition um, as compared to these back related claims. Um, it's minor. It's $105 and $145 for these visits, but they just shouldn't be there. So you definitely want to make sure you're doing a fine, uh, fine tooth comb look at these and, and making them get this lean right. Here's an Equian claim summary. Notice how they look a little different. And I'm sure if you've handled any number of these that you've seen all the variances that um, are with these different companies and how they put these things together. But why is this blank? This just, this shouldn't be the case. Um, 
And really the, the reason why this is, is because Equian is pulling information from whoever this health insurance company is. Let's say it's Blue Shield. Um, they're pulling information from Blue Shield system and there's some kind of glitch that took place. Use that glitch to your advantage. If they can't figure this out and they can't get the information, then you shouldn't have to pay these claims. Um, doesn't mean that you're going to win that argument, but it's definitely an argument that you should be making um, and make them jump through some hoops to prove their case. So here's of Rawlings claim summary. Um, this is where you can see this zero dollar, this final line down here, it's for a hospital and it shows a billed amount of zero and then a paid amount of $24,000. Um, notice the CPT description box says client provided aggregation claim. That's a, that's a problem on their end. Um, they can provide a breakdown. Um, do they want to? Are they going to volunteer to do it? No. So that's why you have to ask for it. Um, but at the end of the day, they should be able to provide individual CPT codes, individual build amounts, and it might be just like this that shows zero dollars as the paid amount, but at least you are getting a full breakdown and you can make sure that that paid amount is not more than the build amount. You also want to compare this to the bills that you may have received um, and that you used for the underlying settlement because if they're showing bills of eighty thousand dollars and you had bills of twenty thousand dollars that's another conversation that needs to be had here is care first um, this one has inadequate billing codes so notice this fourth column here it's it's type of service and it just says medical care ambulance medical care x-ray if those are on the data loss then sure you can go with it but when they're beyond the data loss and you can see this one here is got dates throughout 2015 and, uh, and the ambulance on um, the last couple days of 2014 we need more detail here this is not an acceptable way for them to assert their claim and demand hundreds thousands tens of thousands of dollars of the settlement funds if they can't provide more detailed information here they can do it they just don't want to so um, you definitely need to push them to do so conduit uh, this this is um again a little bit of laziness on their part but they've this is a multiple family member um, claim summary and they've got all the people listed here um, on the left this is just messy it's not real easy if you've got um individual settlements for each of these people then you want individual liens um, for them to kind of group it all together it's only going to benefit them and they can separate these out but it's easier for them to send it like this and so this is what you're going to get um, so ask for that to be broken down so i've mentioned the recovery vendors that we showed the um claim summaries for each of these big ones and so these these are the the big the big ones in the market um, there's obviously various defense firms there's some internal subrogation units that are collecting um, as well but one thing that i can certainly tell you from the rawlings group's perspective but um, also from from the other companies as well is that they are highly trained there are massive training programs um, you know the big binders with all kinds of information they've got scripts and um, if this happens, then do this. There's there's lots of um, flow charts and things like that that um, that that they do. Um, but those are very narrow arguments. So they are only teaching them the one way that they want them to think that the world of subrogation and lien resolution is. Um, so that's why a lot of times you get back form letters because that's how the system is set up. Um, I know my team often gets frustrated when they put together a great argument with holes in the um, ability for them to seek reimbursement for 100% and instead we just get back a letter that says the McCutcheon case on an ERISA lien or um, with with Medicare for example you send something and within two days you get a denial um, obviously somebody didn't look at that and that's that's a big a big deal um, but that's just them trying to get through their inventory um, these companies here people are holding anywhere from 500 to 1,000 individual lien files, and you are just one of them. And they've got lots of uh, policy and procedure and tracking of analytics and all kinds of things that are in place that are making sure that they're touching files, that they're sending out responses, that they're um, 
making phone calls and all of these things that um, that make them do things more quickly. They don't have time to sit and dig through or really even read your three-page letter. Um, the three-page letter, they jump to the final paragraph and see what it is you're offering. And if it's not pretty close to the full amount, then they're sending you out a generic form letter as a response. They also have very limited authority to reduce. Um, depends on the company, but a lot of the companies um, actual file handlers have very limited, like very little, like they might be able to do that 10% reduction. Um, some of them are as little as 5%. Depending upon the dollar amount of the lien, it might be 0% and they have to have it reviewed by their manager or their legal department um, in order to offer any kind of reduction. At the end of the day though, they're incentivized by bonus. And it's different bonuses for different companies. Um, some are a smaller bonus, but others are tied to each individual check. So that particular file that you're trying to get $10,000 off of means that that person is giving up a particular dollar amount out of their own check by giving you that reduction. So the big key is to convince them through all of these, all of these means that we've talked about to actually fill out a form, get up out of their chair and go and get the reduction. Like the first key is to get them on your side to understand that in order to resolve this thing, that they're gonna have to take a little bit of a hit. Because for them, they see whatever that dollar amount is of the lien, it's a $10,000 lien, they're doing math on how much money am I gonna get from taking $10,000 from this injured person. And other ones are maybe not as financially motivated, but instead they're motivated by a fear factor that exists with some of these, where it's like, oh, if I go and tell my legal person again that, I can't get this done, then it's gonna look like I'm not doing my job. So it's a lot easier for the representatives to just say no while they're sitting in their chair. Um, no reduction. No, I'm not gonna look at your legal argument. No, I'm not gonna remove that unrelated treatment because it's easier for me to just leave it there. Um, all these companies deal with lots of different lean types. So you're seeing them on ERISA, you're seeing them with Medicare Advantage, uh, Medicare Supplements, FIBA, and Medicaid are the big ones. Um, Equian also does some hospital lien work. So um, you are probably quite familiar, but I just wanted to give some background on kind of how it is that they operate. All right, so now to talk about ERISA liens in particular, uh, when it comes to an ERISA plan, what is it that you should be looking at? So you wanna be doing an assessment of the plan's rights and an ERISA lien, is governed by their contract language. So you have to get that. You have to get the contract language in order for you to know what it is that that lien holder is looking at. So the lien holder will have the SPD, the summary plan description, readily available. And they'll send it to you if you ask them for it. Um, they'll also probably send it to you if you just ask for a reduction and they'll send it to you as the reason why they don't have to reduce. But the other document you actually want to be getting is the master plan document. Um, sometimes there isn't one, but usually there is. And again, it's not as easy for them to get it. So you might get some resistance there. But um, through a ERISA document request, you can request it directly of the employer. We call it just a 1024 request, but it's uh, that is the part of the ERISA statute, it's 1024B4, uh, that allows the plan participant, which is the injured party, to request documents from their employer, and those include these documents, the summary plan description, the master plan, and the form 5500, um, among other documents, but these are the most important ones. So the form 5500 is a tax document um, a lot of attorneys seem to misuse it or otherwise get confused by it. I know I've done other webinars where I dug a little deeper on what to look for with the Form 5500, but you're basically looking at the schedules to see if the health plan that has covered the medical benefits for your injured party are listed on the Schedule A or the Schedule C. If they're on the Schedule A, there's a great argument that it is a fully insured plan and therefore subject to state law. If it's on the Schedule C, then there's a strong possibility that it's self-funded and otherwise governed by the plan documents. Um, I say strong because it shouldn't be the deciding factor. Uh, it should be one of a couple documents that you are using to um, really assess that and, and 
taking it into consideration. Um, as I already said, um, we talked about those billing statements, those lien claim summaries. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you are auditing them and taking a look at them because there can be a lot of things in there that are just making that lien be bigger than it should be. So that's the billing codes, whether it's something that you can match up to your um, bills that you have, to things that you've put in your demand, um, whether the charges are all bundled up and it's been just a big lump payment that you can't really see the breakdown, all of those things are things you want to be auditing and, and making sure that it's proper. And then again, understanding the law. So as I said, if it's a fully insured plan, then it's state law. And if it's a self-funded plan, then it's federal law, which then turns to the contract language. So this is the big, the big thing. A lot of times I hear attorneys just say that it's an ERISA plan. That's the first step. Is it ERISA? And ERISA is basically just an employer-based health plan, um, not including government employers or religious employers, but pretty much all other employers can be classified in that ERISA bucket. But the big key is the self-funded versus fully insured. Um, so this is um, just kind of an explanation on, on what that is, and it can be confusing because for both, the employer will collect premiums off the employee's paycheck. So um, your client could have $40 removed from every paycheck for their health insurance. This alone doesn't really tell you which, which bucket it's going into. Um, for the self-funded plan, those funds are held in a separate account. They are, um, they are kept by the employer and that's what makes it self-funded. It's the employer funded account. So they put money in there and then the employees put money in there. Um, on the other side for fully insured, those premiums come out of the paychecks and then the payment gets made as a premium to an insurance company. And then that, that's what's fully insured. Um, really getting to the bottom of like what's happening there, it's super hard to do, right? Like you're not gonna necessarily be able to ask uh, a lien holder, can you tell me about the separate account that's being held? And so this is where there's a little bit of trust that ends up taking place um, when we are negotiating these outside of a litigation realm. Um, so the other confusing part is that the insurance carrier is involved in both. So if it's a self-funded plan and the funds are held in a separate account, they might be enlisting Cigna to be the administrative service provider, which means that Cigna is paying the claims, but they're paying the claims with the money that's in the employer account versus Cigna on a fully insured plan, they're paying it out of the big Cigna account because that employer only paid premiums. They're not actually financially responsible for um, the, the payment of the, like the, the actual source of the payment of the claims. So this is a big important um, piece because this is what dictates what law controls. All right, so there's been a number of U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, Montanil is one of the latest ones um, from 2016, and it's one that there seems to be a little bit of confusion around, perhaps. Some people haven't heard of it at all. Some people have heard of it and then think that it means that they can just disperse funds, ignore the lien, and be totally fine. Um, but this case, in my opinion, was very fact-specific, and the big key facts are that the attorney was being very proactive in trying to have negotiations of the lien with the lien holder. The lien holder was not responsive. So that's the big key. If you've got a lien holder that is not responding to your letters, then that's where your Montanil flag could go up. But if you've got an, a, a lien holder that's just telling you no or um, giving you reasons why they won't reduce or any of those things, then Montanil really isn't going to apply. So also with, with Montanil, uh, the attorney documented their efforts by sending these letters, and then they also gave time deadlines to respond. And the final one was a 14-day deadline. If we don't hear from you within 14 days, we've already given you months to be an active participant in this negotiation, then we're going to go ahead and disperse. And the attorney did. And six months later, the plan came back knocking on the door with their handout and wanted reimbursement for their lien because it was now convenient for them. Um, so lots of little nitty gritty things that, that um, were discussed in it, but at the end of the day, it was just that because they weren't an active participant and because those funds had been 
spent on non-traceable items and couldn't be uh, traced back to the actual identifiable fund, that that's where the plan could not enforce its lien. So this is certainly something that you can bring up to a lien holder when they are not being responsive. Um, I know when this case first came out in 2016 that Rawlings and, and other companies as well had um, specific responses if you cited this case. They had a specific form letter that they would toss back out at you. So um, just make sure that it is fact um, fact focused. Um, and like I said, if the plan is participating, then it's not gonna work. All right, I am rounding the bend here. So um, just briefly with military liens, um, we definitely handle these. They are um, often confusing, it seems. Um, and it's it's really, it's a little bit of that government red tape of like, where where do I go? Who do I talk to? Who do I, re who do I send this notice to? How do I, how do I get a lien? Um, and there's just lots of different um, things and delays that, that can happen. So my recommendation is that if you have a client who has a military lien, that you get us involved sooner than later uh, so that we can start the process because it can often be a couple months before we even get the first communication back from TRICARE or a VA facility. So TRICARE, VA, these are um, for military members and their family. And um, it is a statutory right. And I've got their, the citations um, for two different areas about when they would reduce their claim. So um, two reasons, the convenience of the government. So take, take that as you will. Um, and then the second part as um, a reason to reduce is hardship to the beneficiary. Well, there's always hardship to the beneficiary, right? Like that's, that's what we always use when we try to reduce a lien. Um, but this is a, a list of things that the government will consider when it comes to um, reducing their interest. Um, specifically, there's not a deduction that is allowed for attorney's fees. And ultimately, there isn't a cap on the amount that they can collect for their lien. Um, so there are, just like with the other vendors that we talked about, there are authority issues um, on these, depending upon the amount of the lien, the person that you're talking to might not have the authority. It might need to be reviewed by somebody else or get sent to a different location in order to have that lien reviewed for reduction. Um, they do look at the bottom line of how much will the beneficiary receive. And a big part of that goes into whether or not the attorney is reducing their attorney fee. That's a big um, question that we get really across the board, um, certainly a sore subject, um, but nonetheless, if you are planning to reduce your fee, that is something that you want to make sure that you're telling them, and if we're handling it for you, you wanna make sure you're telling us, um, because that's that's a big thing for them. Um, they think that it's, if you're willing to take a cut, then they'll be willing to take a cut, essentially. Um, as far as futures go for these military liens, um, they will pay for future medicals, um, but there are some times where they will tack on a percentage of futures as as expected. Um, whatever future amount might be expected, they'll tack it on to the current lien amount. So um, that can be a confusing thing when you're looking at a lien and it's $90,000 and all of a sudden it appears like it's 110 and that's because they've added on um, this future piece. I, I don't think we see it all the time, but it is something that has come up from time to time. So just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And I have reached the end and I'm going to pass it back to Dan for a quick transition to our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. While you hand the presenter over to Michael, um, just a couple of high-level comments. Um, working backwards, um, whenever you're working uh, on a case where there's going to be a military lien, the sooner your plaintiff learns that that's going to take a while, the better for you as their representative. So I'm always encouraging our clients, have that conversation with your client early, early, early on that the military liens, that they're even slower now this past year than they were before. Um, and there's very little that can be done to accelerate that process. Um, so as, as a group that is handling um, hundreds of those at a time, it's it's really, really hard to get things done quickly um, in that regard. 
Um, and then at a high level, thank you, Teresa, you know, for kind of giving us the insider look at the, the sub row contractors that we're up against, right? The important thing is when the law is not on your side via McCutcheon and you're dealing with debt collectors that are commission-based employees handling thousands of files, us going to war with them with the death by a thousand cuts, um, and I say us as a plaintiff side of the table, is effective, right? We need to make it as hard for them to collect this money as it was for you to get it. Going back to my original comments, that's only fair. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Michael Walrath to introduce himself and present on hospital liens and the wins that we're having in that space. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Um, thanks for being here. I am not sure if you can see my screen, but it's something that I am uh, working on if you can't. Um, my name is Michael, last name is Walrath. I have been litigating and now negotiating the reasonable value of hospital care and healthcare in general for uh, 15 years or so. Um, let me see. I uh, again moderator note, Michael. Uh, yeah. You may want to close your Teams on your on your computer. How about now, Dan? Am I? Your screen's perfect. We can see your slide. You're ready to go. Okay, so, great. Thanks. Great. Uh, we're going to be talking today about best practices on on uh, resolving hospital liens, and I'm having a little trouble getting my slides to move but I will get there, forgive me. There we go. Um, as I said, I've been negotiating and litigating hospital reasonableness for 15 years in a bunch of different contexts. Um, everything from working for an international insurance company's in-house council where a large part of our, our function was to reduce these hospital bills to a litigation law firm in Miami where we exclusively litigated the reasonable value of hospital bills and usually hospital liens uh, in that context. Hospital liens nationally are a creature of either statute or contract. Now, there are some exceptions like Florida, where is, which is where I happen to be, where we don't have a state statute, but instead have individual county statutes. But generally speaking, I'll call all of those statutory liens and contractual liens are just liens that are similar to your letter of protection liens that effectively are created by agreement between the patient and the provider. Uh, 40 states in the District of Columbia have hospital lien statutes. I have them listed there. Uh, and in Florida, nine of our 67 counties still have liens and nine states have no lien statutes. So in all of those states and especially those states which do not have lien statutes, hospitals can and often do create liens on admission by adding lien language to their admission contracts. Um, so it's important no matter what, to follow the law and follow the facts of your individual case to determine whether or not there is a lien and how much that lien is, whether it's limited, uh, whether there's equitable distribution provisions in your lien statute and things like that. Here are a few examples. California does have a lien by statute. Uh, for those of you in California, you're very familiar with statute 3045. Uh, it does limit liens to reasonable charges and to 50% of the proceeds, so that's helpful in your limited policy cases. Illinois also has a statewide hospital lien statute limited to reasonable charges or 40% of the proceeds, and the lien rights cut off hard stop at the date of settlement. Ohio is one of those states that does not have a lien statute. Um, they're also, oh, I've lost my screen again. There we are. Um, there, there, are no, there are no county ordinances that I'm aware of, so hospitals, like anyone else, can create a lien by, by contract, but do not have a statute. And as you likely know, especially those of you in states with robust lien statutes or ordinances, those statutes carry all sorts of exposure and, 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 and legal peril for the lawyer as well as, as the patient. And so those kinds of teeth typically are not in the, in the contractual liens. The contractual liens are very simple uh, simple lien rights that are added to a to an admission agreement. Florida, as we mentioned, does have nine counties that still have liens after the Supreme Court here declared all the others unconstitutional for uh, a long-winded reason we don't need to go into. All of our ordinances do limit the, the uh, liens to reasonable charges, 
but it does not include any equitable percentage, unlike the other states we just looked at. Uh, what that means, unfortunately, for those of us in Florida facing hospital liens against our settlements, we do have the possibility that if the reasonable value of hospital care exceeds the settlement amount, the hospital can take the entire settlement. No legal fees, no legal costs even, and nothing to the patient. Hospital gets the whole thing as a matter of law. Uh, however, most hospitals, as most of you here have experienced, will agree to an equitable distribution of a limited settlement, especially as Teresha mentioned, uh, if, if, if you're willing to reduce your fees. Uh, because hospitals know that as a matter of business, if they were to take entire settlements, the lawyers would simply stop taking cases that involve their liens and they're getting free collection work out of us, unfortunately, so they didn't want to keep doing that. Uh, Texas, another example, does have a statute. It is limited to, lead to reasonable charges. Uh, the Supreme Court has confirmed that reasonless requirement. A good case in for those of you in Texas, which you're probably aware of, the Haygood case, did give the right to discover a bunch of things in determining that reasonable value. And also specifically mentioned that the cost of care is relevant to reasonable value. And we're gonna get into cost of care a little bit later. Um, I'm gonna go kind of move ahead because I know that we are on, a, on the clock here. Maryland is an interesting state, uh, very challenging to argue reasonable value because it is the last what is called all payer state in the country. That basically means that hospital charges are similar to the rates that are paid by uh, managed care and by Medicare and they are approved by a commission, which all together means that essentially hospital bills in Maryland are legally determined or deemed to be per se reasonable. Um, that's tough. The, the, the statute itself does limit liens to work comp rates. However, work comp rates are effectively limited to the commission rates, which again are effectively the full bill charges. So all that said, though, we do have a lot of success in reducing bills in Maryland. Um, I think it's for the same business reasons that I just mentioned. So reduction strategies. Uh, you know, if we're talking about reasonable value, which we almost always are, unless it's a limited settlement, how do we figure out what that is? How do we get there from here? Um, your hospital, forgive me, problem again. Um, the, most firms of attorneys, what happens is they basically engage in blind negotiation from the full bill charges down. Uh, both parties typically frame that as a discount from the full bill charges. The hospital will offer a discount or the attorney will ask for a discount. And that sort of begs the question, is the full bill charge due in the first place? And the reality is it is not. So you're not really asking for a discount when you're asking to pay reasonable value. You're offering to pay the full amount that is due and owing, both as a debt and as a lien. So I am very careful uh, with my team to make sure we don't frame things in those terms. Uh, I don't think that we're seeking a discount at all. I think we're offering to pay the full undiscounted reasonable value of the claim. The fact that they pretend that they are entitled to three times that amount does not somehow make it a discount. Um, what I find from most attorneys that I speak with is, you know, you're kind of stuck with accepting the best discount you can get, um, to use the wrong terms again. So a 20 to 30% reduction from full bill charges is pretty common. When I have my live presentations, which seem like a thing of the past, but I know we're gonna get back to it one day, uh, I always ask firms up front, um, just to get the context and the lay of the land, what do you all usually expect? What do you usually get as uh, reductions on these hospital liens? And I hear basically three answers. Number one, we always expect at least 20% off. Number two, average around 30%, not bad, not great. And if we can get 40% off, that's a home run. Uh, we don't get 40% on those cases. That's what I hear. Um, and it's not that there's anything wrong with that. That is literally the very consistent message I get from firms across the country on, on this issue, regardless of what state you're in. But I do believe there's a better approach. And I believe that at least here at Synergy, we employ that better approach. And what I call that approach is inverting the argument. And it really goes back to what I was saying before about discounts. Um, if you can define that reasonable value, you no longer are seeking a discount. You want to define that reasonable value and negotiate up from there, as opposed to starting at this unrealistic, unsupportable number that nobody pays and asking for 
negotiating back and forth for discounts off of that unreasonable amount, it just doesn't make sense. So defining the reasonable value is important. And what we define that reasonable value as is the cost of care plus a reasonable profit. I believe that a jury of lay people would probably find that to be the easiest to understand definition of reasonable value. How much did it cost to render the service? And what is a reasonable profit above that cost? Luckily, with hospital care, you can determine the cost of care. It can be derived from a document that every hospital submits to the federal government under oath every year. That is called a hospital cost report. It's part of the Medicare compliance requirements for all hospitals that accept Medicare, which are effectively all hospitals. And once you use that data, you can hone in pretty, pretty well on the cost of care for any hospital bill in this country. Um, experts who testify on reasonable hospital charges routinely testify that a reasonable profit would be somewhere between 40 and 50 percent above costs. Uh, principally, the probably best or most well-known expert in the country is Dr. Gerard Anderson out of Johns Hopkins. He's testified before Congress on this very issue in excess of 40 times. Every time his, his testimony is that cost of care plus a reasonable profit above cost um, is effectively the reasonable value. And he's written him and his team have written several scholarly peer-reviewed articles uh, on that exact methodology. Um, what I've found, uh, you know, we want to try to translate that into what we see in practice, right? So what does that translate to as far as a reduction from an unreasonable full bill charge? Typically, reasonable value when viewed from cost up tends to be about 20% or 30 to 35% of the full bill charges can be more or less, depending on what services were rendered, all the cost to charge ratios for the different departments are different. So if a bill is very heavy on CT scans, for example, it's gonna have a much lower reasonable value than a bill that's very heavy on operating room time, which has a higher cost to the hospital of rendering. But good rule of thumb, 20% of bill charges, 35% of bill charges is where we see these numbers falling once we do all the fancy analysis. Um, so when you invert the argument, as I've recommended here. What kind of results do you see? And I wanted to give you a quick case study. This is from an actual case that we assisted with. Full bill charges of $95,000. Blind negotiations is what I call the traditional way this is done, uh, negotiating down from full bill charge, in other words. The typical results, according to most of the firms who've answered that question for me, are 20% discount, a 30% discount, or a 40% discount. And as you can see here, at a 20% discount, you're offering the hospital a 641% profit above cost on this particular bill. In other words, we analyze the cost of care and the reasonable value here. And at a 20% discount from full bill charges, 641% profit. I think that's hardly uh, anyone would agree that that is reasonable. It's a, it's a very high, but at a 30% discount, you're still over 400% profit. And at a 40% discount, remember that was the home run that, that most firms uh, report to me when I ask about it. You're still offering the hospital a 344% profit. So once we inverted the argument, we determined the reasonable value and it was estimated to be approximately 20 grand in this case. And as you can see, that came in right about where I said it would, around 20% of the full build charges. So that was arrived upon by taking the actual cost of every line item on the bill, adding a 50% profit above cost brought us to $20,000 on this $95,000 bill. And then we negotiated up from there, again, inverting the argument. In doing so, 25% above that reasonable value is 25 grand, which is a 74% reduction from full bill charges. A 50% markup above the reasonable value, above 20,000, would be 30 grand and that would be a almost 70% reduction from full bill charges. And even if you were to pay twice the reasonable value, in other words, we know that experts would testify that the reasonable value of this $95,000 bill is 20 grand. However, we're offering you 40, you're still at almost a 60% discount. So you can see how much better the results are using this inverted argument methodology. Um, so on the $95,000 bill, what happened in this particular case was the hospital had offered a 30% discount before Synergy was engaged. And uh, as you may or may not be aware, that is typically, we have a couple of fee structures. That's the principal fee structure for lien resolution. 
um, we, we do charge a percentage of savings. So we ask in advance, did the hospital offer you a discount first? And if they did, we, we only charge a fee on additional savings. Here, there was a 30% discount in place. That doesn't mean we can't help. And in fact, here's a good example of how we did and can help. Uh, Synergy then was able to negotiate this after analyzing the bill for reasonable value. And we got the hospital to accept 50% above the reasonable value, 30 grand on this $95,000 bill, which means that there was an additional 36,000, almost $37,000 savings by uh, engaging our services. Even after our fee, the additional savings to the client was over $30,000 by using us. So perfect example, hospital offered a 30% discount. As you saw on the previous slides, that's right in the middle of what most firms will accept somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. So this was one that the firm probably before they engage us had a pretty robust discussion about whether they should engage us or just advise the client to accept the uh, 30 percent discount. I'm glad they didn't because the client ended up with an extra thirty thousand dollars in their pocket by by recommending uh, letting us take a shot at it. So how do we do it? Well we, we basically have uh, packed our ammunition box tight with everything we need to, to fight these hospitals on these bills. Just remember that there's a whole, there's a very unfair playing field here. Um, hospitals have all the data. They have everything and we have nothing, right? Like the plaintiff's lawyer, the general plaintiff's lawyer who's, who's, who's negotiating this bill with the hospital, basically all they have is the bill and the hospital's opinion of what you should pay. They don't have anything else. And, and so that was really our goal here was how do we get the ammunition we need? Um, we have coding experts, of course, and, and, and hospital billing experts in general who can look at all the charges and remove all the errors, uh, the non-billable charges. Ironically, you don't see a lot of billing errors going in that direction. There are always extra stuff on the bill. We remove all of that, of course. And then we calculate the hospital's cost of care for your specific bill, add that reasonable profit of 50%, as I said, and, and then we apply it to the law in your jurisdiction. Um, all the jurisdictions are different, of course, but Generally speaking, reasonable value is the common thread between them. Um, the, the basing the opinion on the hospital's own sworn cost data not only gives us additional data to use, which is important, kind of leveling the playing field in and of itself, but it also is their data. It's data that they created, that they swore to under oath and submitted to the federal government. They can't say it's wrong. Um, they can disagree with the methodology. They can disagree with their interpretation of the lien law and the cases interpreting it, but they can't say that data is wrong, which to me has proven to be a very valuable um, weapon in this fight. I wanted to touch quickly on something that I have coined as the lien debt dichotomy, and I think it's super important. Um, also think that it's, it's widely misunderstood in this lien context. Uh, what I mean by this lien context is unlike all of the liens that Teresa just described, and there's a lot of them, as you heard, all different flavors of reimbursement liens. That's a provider that has been paid already, so they're out of the picture, and you're dealing with whomever is trying to get reimbursed for that payment. Um, there's no debt associated with those liens. Nobody owes anybody any money. You don't ever owe your insurance company back money when they treat, when they pay your benefits unless there's this lien right that's created by the recovery. And that lien right is the only right that you're concerned with. It's the only thing you have to deal with because there's no debt. Well, in these direct provider liens, which are providers who've not been paid yet by anyone, it's completely different. There is a lien, as we said in the outset here, based on either a statute, a county ordinance, or a contract. So there's a lien against a settlement, which is nothing more than a security interest against the settlement, sort of like a mortgage secures your home loan to your property. This lien merely secures your debt to your settlement. Um, so there is a lien and that lien carries with it both ethical and legal exposure for the attorney, of course, and that is important. Um, but there's also this debt, right? There's always an underlying debt when it comes to a direct provider lien, like a hospital lien or a letter of protection lien. That um, debt and lien difference is super important and it needs to be explored before you engage in negotiations um, including whether it's contractual or statutory so 
if you determine there is a valid lien against the settlement, you basically have your marching orders. You know that you have to get it resolved. So you have to review the language of the statute of the contract to understand what that lien really is, what it's limited to, what it isn't limited to. Of course, the common law comes into play in many cases because a lot of this stuff's been interpreted by the courts over and over again. Um, then you effectively do all the stuff that I just went through. You estimate the reasonable value. And you also, I recommend anyway, and this is certainly what we do, is you calculate the equitable distribution amount. Even if there is no equitable distribution available under the statute, as is the case in Florida, or if there is an equitable percentage baked into the lien statute, you need to run that math. So you know which is better, right? Um, if you get a better reduction through an equitable argument, either through the statute or otherwise, uh, you, you want to lead with that remembering that there may be a debt balance because resolving a lien does not necessarily resolve a debt. It just severs that security instrument. The debt is still outstanding. Although as most of you have probably experienced, most hospitals in these negotiations will agree to a lien release as full and final payment of the debt. Um, once, you, once you've made that uh, estimation of which is better for your client, the reasonable value or the equitable reduction, you negotiate for the better or the lower of those two. Um, just keeping in mind again, that many of the lien statutes either create or eliminate the opportunity of equitable distribution. So you do have to follow the specific law in your state on what the deal is with equitable distribution. Even if, again, even if there is not the ability to equitably distribute, um, most hospitals will entertain the idea because they, got to maintain some sort of business relationship with the plaintiff's bar or else you all will stop bringing them money at all. Um, now, what if you find out in that initial before pre-negotiation investigation, you find out there is not a lien and that these medical bills or hospital bills, whatever the case may be, are merely debts that your patient owe, your client owes to their healthcare providers. First of all, you want to return, uh, obtain that written confirmation right out of the gate. You want something in writing, whether it be a simple as an email chain back and forth where you finally convince them to agree that they do not have a lien, or some providers are much more you know, amenable to just sending you a letter that says, we do not, we're not pursuing lien rights, we have a debt of $100,000, right? Um, you need that in writing, and then you know that your ethical requirements with regards to the settlement are satisfied. You don't have to pay a debt out of your settlement. I have not yet seen any state um, that requires that debts to mere creditors be paid out of a settlement, even if it's accident related care. Uh, if there's a lien, of course, you must protect that lien and trust in pretty much every jurisdiction um, until it is resolved amicably or by adjudication adjudication, but debts, it's not so. You, any creditor could say they want you to pay out of the settlement, but the reality is if you're a mere creditor and you have a debt, you can pursue collections of that debt and that is about it. So uh, once you've gotten that written confirmation, you need to determine what your client wants to do. Do they want to resolve the debt from the settlement proceeds or not? If they do, then same as we said before, you negotiate for the reasonable value or, or some other you know, methodology to get you a reduction that everybody is equally unhappy with. Um, but if they do not want to pay the debts out of the settlement, you can disperse. In fact, in many states, it's been this issue's come up, Florida being one of them, you must disperse. Most of the state's uh, trust rules, which I've reviewed, do say that you have to disperse if there is no legal claim to the settlement proceeds. And to the settlement proceeds is important. That, do, that doesn't mean a debt against the person. It means an attachment to the settlement. And so uh, dispersing to the client is really their call. I just obviously recommend a pretty detailed CYA kind of letter in your file that the client has been made aware of the debt, that the patient will at some point be pursued in collections. The hospital might sue them. You're not representing them if they do, all that good stuff. So, so more importantly, though, because, you know, there's two kinds of clients, as you all know, in this regard. Many clients really don't care about a big hospital debt because they're not going to pay it and they're not going to be able to collect from them. They're basically judgment proof. So 
they say, why would I pay it? I want my $30,000, you know, 30,000 that's being held in trust. I just want it and I'll deal with the collections action when and if it comes and it may never come or if it does, it won't hurt them any. Other clients, it's the most important thing in the world, right? Like I can't possibly, I don't want this going to collections. I want everything resolved. That's what I paid you for. I get it. So, so or you got to figure out who, you, who, who they are, who your client is in that regard. Um, getting that signed acknowledgement from the ones who do want the money though, is, is a very important step for you to protect your firm and to inform your client, frankly, that, you know, this isn't just walk away. Uh, they're going to end up dealing with this at some point. So in conclusion, um, our services always result in a net pre-suit savings or else we don't charge you a fee. Now we do have some small lean uh, administrative fees on, on really, really little ones. That's a, a, a different issue, but generally speaking, hospital lien resolution through Synergy is a zero risk proposition. We either get an additional savings to where you are or else we don't charge you anything. So I like to think that it is always in the client's best interest to at least call us, let us uh, give you our opinion on whether we can add value and how much, and um, give us a shot because if we don't get it done, it, it doesn't hurt. And you've, if nothing else, completed your uh, obligations to your client. Um, the fees, Thanks very much, Michael. You, you're very welcome. You're welcome, Dan. Thank you, guys. And thanks. You guys, if anybody has any specific questions beyond, we're, of course, happy to answer them here. But I also wanted you to see uh, I'm, I'm available by email or by my direct line anytime. So please feel free to reach out. Thanks, Michael. And while Michael hands the presentation from Miami to Chicago, um, just, just again at a high level, um, I mentioned the synergy passion at the beginning of this presentation. And, and, and one of the things that we are most passionate about, and I know that I am personally, is the fact that these hospitals are taking our uninsured plaintiffs or those on public benefits and, and billing them at a made up retail rate that is 10, 20, 30 times what any other insurer would pay is ludicrous at best and, and we are so proud of the opportunity um, to prevent that from yeah. happening uh, in, with the hospitals that you're dealing with. So again, Michael uh, shared his contact information and I know that some folks have shared some questions. We are gonna do a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so you can submit your questions in the question box. You can do it in the text um, on the GoToWebinar as well. And we'll address all those at the end. We've got several thus far. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Rasa Fumagali to address all things Medicare. Thank you, Rasa. Thank you, Dan. So is my screen showing correctly? It absolutely is. Great. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Rasa Fumagali. I am the Director of Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance here at Synergy Settlement Services. Prior to joining Synergy, I was the VP of MSP Compliance for a national vendor that focused primarily on the defenses aspect of Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance. So joining Synergy is a great opportunity to share some secrets and some tips and some pointers in terms of how CMS views MSP compliance. So let's take a look at Medicare in general before we dive into the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. Now, Medicare was rolled out in 1965 and is a federal health insurance program for people who are 65 and older. If the individual has worked and paid Medicare taxes for at least 10 years, you could become eligible for these benefits if you're awarded Social Security disability benefits or railroad retirement benefits for a period of 24 months. It is also available to people with unstage renal disease. So in 1980, Congress passed the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, which made Medicare a payer of last resort when a primary payer had a demonstrated responsibility for payment of services. So as you can see from the slide, Medicare is a secondary payer when payment has been made or can reasonably be expected to be made under a workers' comp law, an automobile, a liability insurance policy, a self-insured plan or under no fault insurance. The exception to this occurs when payment is not reasonably expected to be made promptly. Medicare does not want their beneficiaries to go without treatment, so they are willing to make the payment conditioned upon reimbursement to the appropriate Medicare trust fund 
once the settlement or judgment is issued. So you can see from 42 CFR, there, this particular provision states that Medicare is actually precluded from making payment for services to the extent that payment has been made or can reasonably be expected to be made under these different plans. And if you look at the phrase, payment has been made or to the extent that payment has been made, this is very relevant because the settlement that agreement that is reached between the parties in the eyes of Medicare is actually a payment that has been made. Now, a primary payer's reimbursement obligation can be demonstrated in a few ways. Through a judgment, a payment conditioned upon a release of payment for items included in a claim against the primary payer. Because of this, you have to be really careful in what you are seeking when you are representing a Medicare beneficiary. You don't want to allege everything under the under the sun in terms of the pleadings. It's really important to frame out exactly what conditions are truly related to the trauma and what it is that you're gonna be settling for. A demonstration of responsibility can also be shown by other means, such as through a contractual agreement. So when you think about Medicare secondary payer compliance in a case, there are really three areas to consider. You need to address the conditional payments, which are past payments. You need to avoid a cost shift of future injury-related payments to Medicare upon settlement. And you should consider the impact of the Section 111 mandatory insurer reporting obligation of the defendant and work to make sure that the correct diagnosis codes are being reported to Medicare at time of settlement. This Section 111 reporting is the enforcement mechanism for the MSP Act. It basically puts some teeth into the whole process. So a lot of times people, you know, take the position that, well, this is now workers' comp. There's a lot of guidance in workers' comp. As a liability plaintiff's attorney, I really don't need to worry about anything in terms of futures. And I would caution that there actually is quite a bit of risk in taking that position. You can see from the slide that Medicare, in addition to clearly having the MSP Act reference liability plans, they have put out a notice of proposed rulemaking, which was initially introduced in December of 2018 and was continued to March of 2021. Here it is the end of April, and of course, we still don't have anything. But if you look at the language of this rule, this is going to give you a feel for how Medicare views Medicare secondary payer obligations when we're talking about liability settlements. You know, it discusses clarifying existing obligations, which is important because the MSP Act clearly puts existing obligations on liability insurance plans. What is interesting about the way that this proposed rule is actually written is that it also talks about offering some additional clarification for no fault and workers' comp settlements. So it's interesting to see what they intend to do with the workers' comp settlements. Now, while these proposed rules were being, this notice of proposed rulemaking was put out, there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff that was going on. So in 2019, there were meetings between stakeholders and CMS in Baltimore. And what the takeaway was that CMS is poised and ready to go. This is going to be a voluntary review program, similar to the workers' comp voluntary review program. It is thought to apply to beneficiaries and those with a reasonable expectation of Medicare entitlement within 30 months of settlement. And it would seem to suggest that the way that they're going to enforce this is going to be through a denial mechanism. So that would mean that if you have a situation where you had a settlement, where the settlement was sufficient to fund post-settlement injury-related treatment, that Medicare would deny a request by providers to pay for post-settlement injury-related care because they should have had an MSA. The other big takeaway here is that all of this is going to fall on the shoulders of the plaintiff. It is going to be a plaintiff's responsibility. So now, although we do not have any specific rules when it comes to liability settlements, you know, one of the things we should consider is CMS's actual actions. 
you know, what is this agency doing? And you can see that the Section 111 mandatory insurer reporting was rolled out to make sure that Medicare had notice of settlements involving Medicare beneficiaries. They also put out the May 2011 CMS stock up memo, which clearly states that Medicare's interest must be protected. The law requires that the Medicare trust funds be protected from payment for future services, whether it's a workers' comp or liability case. There is no distinction in the law. This stock up memo also clarified that a set aside is the preferred method of choice. In September of 2011, CMS also put out a memo that stated no liability MSA was needed when you had a written certification from a treating physician that injury-related treatment had been completed as of the time of settlement and that no future injury-related care would be needed. The fact that they state that no liability MSA is needed when you meet these two factors suggests that you do need a liability MSA when you have other situations. You can also see that over time, CMS has been expected to be advised of smaller and smaller settlements in connection with a mandatory insurer reporting obligation. In October of 2011, liability carriers only had to report settlements that exceeded $100,000. As of January of 2017 to the present, any settlement involving a current Medicare beneficiary with a physical trauma must be reported when it exceeds $750. And that is pretty much going to be everything. Now, other CMS actions will also show that they wanted the new workers' comp review contractor to be able to review liability MSAs. That was one of the um, items that would, was put in the statement of work for the new workers' comp contractor. In December, they put out this notice of proposed rulemaking in terms of liability MSAs. I did fail to mention, though I think I noted in the earlier slide, that Medicare had previously attempted to promulgate proposed rules for liability MSAs in 2013, but they were unable to actually reach agreement. Um, so we are keeping a very close eye on what Medicare is doing with this rulemaking. Now, although the majority of the Medicare secondary payer case law deals with conditional payments, we have also seen a few cases that talk about Medicare's interest in post-settlement future injury-related care. For example, there is a Sterrett versus Klebart state case, Connecticut, the finding that involved the state court approving a settlement and it discussed the way that you could address Medicare's potential interest in future medicals. This particular opinion stated that no MSA is appropriate because the settlement agreement did not include funds representing compensation for future medical benefits. There was also the Benoit case in 2013, and in this particular case, the court applied equitable apportionment of funds for future medical in a compromise settlement. The Aranke versus Burwell case is one that is oftentimes used for what is, in my opinion, an incorrect proposition. This decision states that no federal law or CMS regulation requires creation of an MSA in a personal injury settlement to cover potential future medical expenses. There may be a day when CMS requires the creation of MSAs in personal injury cases, but that day has not arrived. The Medicare set aside is just a settlement tool which allows parties to apportion some of the settlement proceeds for future injury related care. There is never any specific obligation to create an MSA. So this case really should be discussing that the federal law that applies is the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, which means that Medicare is prohibited from making payments when payment has been made. They're, they're analyzing it incorrectly, and this should not be interpreted to mean that you can just go ahead and settle any liability case involving a Medicare beneficiary 
that will require future injury related treatment and the funds are sufficient enough to support future medical care. And that is a dangerous position. It might be one that your client is willing to take. However, there should be a discussion of the Medicare Secondary Payer Act implications on the settlement before that course of action is taken. So what does all of this actually mean for an attorney representing an injury victim in a liability case? So there are certain factors that you should consider when you have a plaintiff that walks in the door. You should first off identify, are they a current Medicare beneficiary? If so, you are going to have to consider conditional payments. You should have a discussion about whether the settlement is one that is funding future injury related care and how you can go about addressing potential issues with post-settlement injury-related care. The other factor to consider is, does this plaintiff has a, have a reasonable likelihood of Medicare entitlement within 30 months of settlement? The reason this is significant, unlike in a workers' comp case where this criteria would mean that you can seek CMS voluntary review of a settlement when it exceeds $250,000, the relevance in the liability settlement is that if your plaintiff is talking about a settlement with um, the defense, with you, and you know they're going to be on Medicare in three months, four months, five months, the potential issue of having a problem with post-settlement future injury-related care is much greater for a person who falls within this 30-month parameter of settlement then, for example, when you have a plaintiff who is not going to be on Medicare for 20 years. So that is just something to factor in. The other thing you should look at is, is this injury one that is likely to require ongoing lifetime injury related care? If it's a soft tissue injury, if it's an orthopedic injury, where the person's treatment is pretty much, you know, reached maximum medical improvement and there's nothing likely to occur, then potential issues with Medicare are slim to none. You should look at, does the settlement fund future medical? And you should also consider, well, what is this plaintiff's risk tolerance? What is my potential risk tolerance as an attorney and the risk tolerance of my firm? Okay, I skip something here. So what do Medicare eligible plaintiffs look like? So as I mentioned earlier, you can be eligible for Medicare when you turn 65. Younger people with disabilities may qualify for benefits if they are receiving Social Security disability benefits. And there are also certain diseases such as end stage renal disease and Lou Gehrig's disease, which will qualify you for benefits under Medicare. So the way that a typical Medicare issue would come up post-settlement would come about in this manner. Say you are settling a case involving a Medicare beneficiary, they are going to require ongoing post-settlement injury-related care. Let's assume it involves the shoulder. You have no discussion with them about what potentially might happen when it comes to post-settlement injury-related care. The settlement is $80,000. What could happen is that Medicare may very well deny care. If that occurs, you will likely be faced with the possibility of a legal malpractice case. Putting that aside, you are gonna have a plaintiff who is extremely unhappy with not having been counseled on this issue. So this is what the denial would possibly look like. This is a kind of letter that was actually sent in a case and it states, your claim has been denied by Medicare because you may have funds set aside from your settlement to pay for your future medical expenses and prescription drug treatment related to your injury. So this is what the denial would look like. So if you are not proactive in your case, you may actually be given certain options by the defense, you know, and the defense's options may not always be appropriate for your case, and they may push you into agreeing to something to just settle the case. It is far better to be proactive. So some of the default options that you might be presented by the defendant would include you know, a request that you fully fund a Medicare set-aside. 
Now, in a liability case, because there are all sorts of different disputes, and your settlement is likely to be a fraction of the total potential case value, by actually fully funding the Medicare set-aside, you are removing funds that should be used to compensate your client for other damages, for you know, perhaps objective economic damages such as medical bills, or there might even be a loss of wage earning capacity if they were working up until the time of the injury. The other default option by the defendant would be to request that you secure that written certification from the treating physician. And this may actually be an appropriate course of action. When the defense, however, is asking you to get this, chances are they're gonna use this to try to mitigate the value of the case, which is not what you wanna do when you're negotiating a settlement. Another option might be to request that your client sign a release that they're not going to bill Medicare. Now, this is not appropriate on many different levels. You should bill Medicare for non-injury related Medicare covered treatment. It's also unlikely that this particular provision would be enforced by a court if it were not followed. So now, in a liability case, as I mentioned, I mean, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. There are caps on damages, procurement costs need to be taken into account, there are policy limits. So the defense's approach is not always the best approach. So as a plaintiff's attorney, your goal should be Medicare secondary payer compliance with the end result either being no MSA for a legitimate reason, or the lowest possible MSA. Now, if we think about what the whole point of Medicare secondary payer compliance is, which is to avoid a cost shift of injury-related expenses to Medicare, there are ways to do this without funding a Medicare set-aside. You can use other health insurance to pay for accident-related treatment. The plaintiff can pay out of pocket as they go for treatment. They can set up a medical savings account. They can set up a settlement preservation trust to earmark funds for future health care. And they can also purchase a structured settlement, which would be designated for any and all future medical care. By using these other resources to pay for post-settlement injury-related care, you are not going to be pushing these expenses onto Medicare post-settlement, and there shouldn't be an issue with Medicare. So our recommendation is that when you do have a plaintiff who's eligible for Medicare benefits, if future accident-related care is a possibility and the settlement is one that contemplates future medical, whether it is sufficient to fund it, though, is a different story. It's a good idea if you are not comfortable with Medicare secondary payer compliance issues to consult with experts to advise your client of the potential Medicare secondary payer implications, and most importantly, to document the file. You never want to have a plaintiff come being, coming back to you and stating that we talked about the settlement. Why didn't you explain to me what could potentially happen with Medicare after I settled the case? And now, once you actually reach a decision on what you're going to do in terms of making sure that the Medicare secondary payer compliance issues are resolved, you are likely going to be presented with demand language or settlement releases by the defense, which are overly broad. They may include all sorts of inconsistent positions, and it's important to have a good handle on how to rebut these um, inappropriate settlement terms. Synergy actually provides consultation in terms of reviewing releases. It's also important to have uh, an agreement as to well, what exactly is being released in this claim so that you can choose the ICD-10 codes, which the defense should have their Section 111 Responsible Reporting Entity report when the case fully settles. One of the ways that you can address all of these issues is through a Medicare expert case evaluation. This is a service that Synergy offers, which helps to simplify Medicare compliance it's always a good idea to start early, to have a strategy. The three possible outcomes from this MISI consultation are 
there might be a decision that really in this case, there's no need to set aside a Medicare set aside because the settlement doesn't fund future medical, or it's a situation where the treating physician has a written certification. It might also be the case that your client simply states, I understand what the potential issues are, but I'm willing to assume the risk and I'm not interested. And that would be the MSA waiver outcome. Or there might be a recommendation that we complete a Medicare set aside analysis. The analysis though would then in certain situations be one that may be appropriate for an apportionment. And the apportionment is a way whereby we look at what the total potential case value is, the net settlement, and we determine what percentage of a fully funded MSA should be carved out from the net settlement. So we finished covering the post-settlement injury-related future treatment. So now let's take a look at Medicare's right to recover conditional payments that were made prior to settlement. And as you can see by the slide, Medicare can recover from a wide range of people when it comes to conditional payments. When you are handling a case that is taking a while to resolve, it's always a good idea to update your file information on the type of coverage. You might have somebody that is enrolled in traditional or original Medicare under Part A and Part B when the case started, but as the years go by, they might actually switch their coverage to a Medicare Advantage plan, Part C and Part D type of plan. And the, the reason this is important is that the conditional payment information is obtained in different ways. This slide shows what the traditional Medicare Part C and Part B conditional payment process looks like. It starts with a report of the case to the Benefits Coordination and Recovery Center. The BCRC issues a rights and responsibilities letter to your client and to you the attorney, and it basically outlines you know, what your obligations are because you are receiving Medicare benefits when you have a third-party settlement. It's important to understand that the BCRC can provide an interim conditional payment letter, which is not a final letter, and it is not something that you should by all means say, well, this is it. There's, there's not much going on here. Because once the case is fully settled, the BCRC is going to do a final conditional payment sweep. They're going to issue a demand, and it's the demand letter that actually is going to start the collection of interest and the potential referral to Treasury if you do not act upon the demand letter correctly. So it's important to pay the demand within 60 days or the lien is going to accrue interest. You can request an appeal but the appeal is not going to toll the interest if you pay the demand and you, you know, at that point you can either appeal or you can request a waiver. I believe Teresa discussed these waiver possibilities for financial hardship and other arguments that can be raised. And this would result in you getting the money back, which you paid out. And, you know, once again, interest is going to be due and payable for each full 30 day period. The debt remains unresolved. Once everything is negotiated with Medicare, they're going to send a letter stating that the lien has been reduced to zero and the case is closed. So I, I did touch upon the Medicare Part C and Part D plans. And these plans are administered by private insurance companies. So you might have a client who doesn't really understand that they're on Medicare because they will say to you, but I'm covered by Humana or Blue Cross Blue Shield. If they're over 65 and you know they are on Medicare, chances are this Blue Cross Blue Shield or Humana is actually a Medicare Advantage plan. So you are never going to be enrolled in Medicare A, B, and C at the same time, a Medicare Part C plan includes all of the Part A and the Part B coverage plus more. For example, there might be vision benefits, which you would not normally have under Part A or Part B. It's also really important to understand that, you know, these Humana plans especially, they are notorious for using the Medicare Secondary Payer Act as their recovery vehicle. You may have seen a lot of litigation involving the private cause of action where these Medicare Advantage plans are trying to pursue various parties to recover conditional payments that were made. And when you have a plan that is using the Medicare Secondary Payer Act as a recovery vehicle, 
They're also bound by the fact that Medicare is prohibited from making payment when payment can be expected to be made by a worker's comp, liability, or no fault type of plan. So they can theoretically deny post-settlement injury-related treatment just like the Medicare Part A and Part B plans can. So now when um, you know, the Medicare Secondary Payer Act is not complied with, I mentioned that these Medicare Advantage plans are able to sue a variety of primary plans, entities, and so forth, and they do this through the private cause of action provision of the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. And this gives them the ability to seek double damages when a primary plan fails to reimburse the secondary plan for conditional payments. Here are some cases that address some of these issues. I think um, you know, an important case is this Humana medical plan case. And in this case, the fact pattern arose from a situation where Western Heritage settled with the plaintiff. And at the time of the settlement agreement, Humana notified everybody that they had a Medicare Advantage plan conditional payment claim. Western Heritage had actually included funds for this in connection with the settlement. The plaintiff, however, was disputing Humana's right to reimbursement. While that dispute was pending, Humana just went ahead and sued Western Heritage and they have the right to do that. So it's really important to make sure that you address these advantage plans before you settle the case. We have also seen a significant increase in Department of Justice actions pursuing firms for unpaid Medicare debts. Some of these debts aren't even astronomical. The Department of Justice is trying to make a point that conditional payments are payments that should not be ignored. And you can see a list of the firms that the DOJ, excuse me, DOJ pursued for these unpaid Medicare debts. So what are some best practices when it comes to conditional payments? I would recommend that you request copies of the Medicare beneficiaries health insurance cards when you are opening the case up. You should also, as I mentioned, seek updated information during the life of the claim. You can get information by looking at billing statements and medical records. You can see, you know, are they sending this to Humana when you have a Medicare beneficiary? You can also confirm your beneficiary's enrollment through the MyMedicare.gov website. And it's critical to actually begin the investigation early. So in conclusion, you can see that we are recommending that you start early when you are identifying Medicare beneficiaries. This will also help you to control the MSP process. You shouldn't just blindly rely on the opposing side's experts. As I mentioned, it's not always, if ever, a good idea to fully fund an MSA when you have a compromised settlement. It's important that you educate your clients on the potential risks. You should go on the, um, you, sh if you are unfamiliar with MSP compliance. You should get your own experts to help you and your clients. We recommend that you go on the offensive for any Part C plans and potential MSA issues, and most importantly, document your file. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Dan, who will hand it off to Jason. Thank you, Rasa. Uh, that was wonderful. We appreciate it. Um, it <clears throat> the Medicare compliance issues are many and are confusing, and you can see why many of Synergy's firm partners across the country um, are grateful for the fact that Synergy can handle each and every piece of that, and again, that not being part of their practice, them never having to worry about Medicare again. Um, we have a solution to make that happen. So um, as you continue to submit questions for the Q&A, which will come right after uh, Jason's presentation, um, if you want to learn any more about partnering with Synergy and what that process looks like, please feel free to email, email me at dan at synergysettlements.com, and I can work on getting you connected with one of our local sales leaders and uh, talking about the Synergy solution and the easiest way for you and your team to um, tap into our uh, expertise and then help you with your practice. So with that, I will hand it over to Jason. Thanks, Dan. Uh, like Dan said, uh, I am also a founder uh, and principal of Synergy and chief executive officer. The presentation that I'm gonna give today is titled the same title as a book I authored on this subject, which 
really goes well beyond a, a presentation that would take 30 minutes. So this is going to be really more high level, uh, just trying to help you guys issue spot on the compliance side of cases, because everything that's been talked about up to this point falls under that big umbrella of critical issues that you need to make sure that you've got a process and program within your law firms to effectively deal with to make sure that the clients ultimately get the best possible result. So to give you a roadmap for today's presentation, I'm gonna hit on the ethical issues high level. Uh, gonna talk a little bit about settlement planning options very briefly, gonna focus the majority of my time talking about government benefits, uh, which is a pretty fertile area of potential mistakes and malpractice traps for trial attorneys. Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about qualified settlement funds, which are a great tool for handling some of the complexities, uh, the issues, all the issues that have been touched upon by other speakers today. So the, the ethical issues and malpractice issues really all stem from the potential failure to advise a client at settlement. And that issue is one I've talked about numerous times and wrote uh, several chapters in the book that I authored, Art of Settlement, on this very subject. And really, it centers upon some questions uh, that I think the answers are uh, a resounding yes to. And those are question, the two questions that I've got top of this slide. Is there an obligation to advise a client regarding public assistance preservation? That, that may be Medicare and SSDI and Medicaid and SSI and other benefits that are potentially impacted by the receipt of settlement proceeds. Again, I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. The second question is same question, but related to the financial options that clients have at settlement. Uh, I believe the answer to that is also around resounding yes. And really it all centers uh, around the ABA model rule uh, 1.0 E informed consent, because ultimately as a lawyer, you have the duty and obligation to provide the necessary information uh, for a client to make uh, the right choice. And that's what that rule embodies. So there's a bunch of different laws that are implicated at settlement, depending upon what your uh, client may be receiving in terms of government benefits and or the financial impact of it. So those are 42 USC uh, 1396 PD4. That's the part of the federal code that uh, authorizes trusts for Medicaid and SSI recipients to not be countable if they put their settlement proceeds into that trust. Next is section 104A2 of the Internal Revenue Code. That pertains to the financial options and 104A2 basically gives injury victims several different options that they can avail themselves in terms of how to take the form of their recovery. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail as I will talk about uh, the 1396 PD4 statute as it relates to special needs trusts. Constructive receipt is, is tied to 104A2. It's an internal revenue code uh, uh, kind of concept. It's not necessarily a, a provision, but it's basically this idea that if you have access to money, whether it's actually in your possession or constructively, that can trigger a tax consequence or here limit options at settlement for an injury victim. And again, I'm gonna talk about these in a little bit more detail. The Medicare Secondary Payer Act, I'm not gonna touch on touch on because Rasa just did a phenomenal job going through all the issues there, but clearly I think probably you, you got the gist of what she was saying is there's a lot of risks, implications there. So it's really important that that be explained to the client in great detail. And there's some cases out there. Grillo is one that's often cited. That case involved trial lawyers being held uh, responsible for legal malpractice for failing to advise about preserving government benefits and also not offering uh, all the financial options at settlement. So an important, an important concept in case. Uh, the French and Saunders cases are cases 
that did basically similar to Grillo, except really focus on the government benefit side of the obligations. And then lastly, you know, the, the model rule of professional conduct 2.1, I think is relevant to this conversation because it does permit lawyers to cons have you know, consultation with professionals in other fields uh, because these are areas that are outside typically the scope or expertise of a trial lawyer. And that's where groups like Synergy are able to come in and fulfill the obligation, making sure the client understands all these issues. And the, the reason that you want to make sure um, that ultimately is because of what I'll talk about on the, on the last part of this is the damages that can flow to it. So to, to summarize, you know, ultimately the, the laws that impact settlement have to be explained to a client uh, because if you fail to do so, there's absolutely no way that client can make an informed decision under the law and no opportunity to exercise certain options that are available to them under the law, which consequently can involve damages. And if you take a look into the, the Grillo case really, and the, and the model rules and you take all of that together, I think the message ultimately to trial lawyers is that you really need to make sure that you employ experts who can make sure that these sorts of issues, whether it's tax or government benefits or Medicare Secondary Payer Act, trust, structured settlements, all need to be explained to that client prior to settlement. And if you don't do so as uh, legal counsel for that client, they're not going to get that advice anywhere else. And ultimately the threshold, whether these issues are, um, are, are significant is quite low because if you've got someone in government benefits, receipt of as little as $2,000 could be catastrophic and cause them to lose their benefits. So, be, be mindful of that issue. And, you know, Rasa used this in her presentation and I'll reinforce it. It really is an important concept. Your firm needs to have a process to make sure that clients are getting the consultations that they need, getting the advice they need, and then that you document in your file what is done. Because if you're not doing that, then you've got the, the exposure and unwanted exposure as it relates to uh, potential uh, issues with malpractice claims that relate to all these things that we've talked about today. So real quickly, I wanted to touch upon settlement planning because this topic is, is usually not sexy, but the, the reality is, is that there's some basics that every trial lawyer needs to be aware of. And, and the first, real basic thing is that clients have three different options, um, really four options at settlement. The, the financial options to manage the recovery are part of what I would uh, tell you that there is this obligation to advise the client about so that they understand what their options are at settlement. So the first option is take the settlement in a lump sum, which many clients do and decide that that's the best way to manage the recovery for themselves. Second is to uh, avail themselves of a structured settlement, which is future periodic payments. And there's a specific exemption in the tax code for putting money into a structured settlement, which involves no taxation of the gain, unlike if they take a lump sum and invest it on their own. Uh, the third option is a trust which for clients that are in government assistance typically is gonna be necessary. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment um, or some combination of those three options, which is fairly typical in more catastrophic claims where there's some, some different issues at play that need to be addressed ultimately. But understanding the basics of that is really important. And then if a client does decide that they do want to do a structured settlement, trial lawyers really need to be aware of some issues that uh, are important considerations when doing a structured settlement. The first one is this concept of rated ages and annuity rates, because that really drives the cost. So making sure that getting the, the all the medical information about the client's injuries or pre-existing 
uh, conditions that cause a, a reduction in life expectancy. That basically impacts the pricing of annuities and there's there's some competitiveness in the market over that. So you wanna advantage, take advantage of that. Another thing is making sure that if a substantial amount of money is structured that you reduce default risk by spreading the money amongst multiple companies. And there's a way to do that to take advantage of the different companies' rates. You also want to know the strength of the life companies that the money is being placed with. That's a really important thing. Liquidity at death, there is a, an ability to commute structured settlements at death to provide funds that are liquid and available. That is particularly important if someone's on government benefits like Medicaid, where there's a payback requirement. And then that concept of constructive receipt, which is the one that uh, is important for trial lawyers to understand that if you take money into your trust account, you've triggered that constructive receipt and it causes problems if the client wants to avail themselves of a structured settlement. So quick overview on, on settlement planning. With that, I'll transition into really what the meat of this is, which is the government benefits. And this is an area that confuses most. And it's it's a complex area for, for lawyers that have to navigate all of these issues uh, for a living. And so, you know, for trial lawyers, it's particularly um, onerous to expect you to understand all the issues. So really what I want to do is give you a high level overview so that you understand, starting with the different government benefits, because it's important to differentiate between what is needs-based and what is an entitlement. Needs-based is Medicaid and SSI, and the Medicaid benefits can either be disability-based or based on financial circumstances. I'll focus on the disability side of it. Um, there's less that can be done when somebody's on benefits that are connected to financial need versus the disability side of things. The entitlements are Medicare and SSDI. Those are not impacted by government benefit, uh, excuse me, by receipt of settlement proceeds. So needs-based means you've got that potentially low threshold, even $2,000 could kick somebody off of their SSI and Medicaid. Medicare and SSDI, Medicare has the MSP related concerns that Rasa outlined, but there are no, um, there's no threshold in terms of a dollar amount that triggers a loss of those benefits. It's really the issues that Ross uh, identified. So making sure that you understand the differences between these benefits and ultimately are able to address those issues are important. And just quickly with secure, social security benefits, there's no lien that social security has at settlement. Uh, with Medicaid, they will have a lien and it's going to vary by state in terms of you know how that lien is addressed and how it can be resolved um, if they are receiving um, medicaid benefits there are challenges under the allborn case that can be quite successful in getting that lien greatly reduced so you always want to make sure that you are uh, working that angle on the medicare side of things uh, rasa touched on the resolution issues for medicare conditional payments and the Advantage plan. So just a quick overview of these different things and we'll get into a little more detail. But if you've got a client who's disabled, really the importance of, of the planning side of it is making sure the government benefits are protected, creating a situation where they have a supplemental pool of money that can support them for the rest of their life, making sure that there's a team put together to protect the rights of that disabled person, and having a long-term and knowledgeable management team that understands the complex rules that regulate Medicaid and SSI. Those rules are, are complicated for, for most lawyers, so you want to have a trust in place to make sure that ultimately those issues are addressed and properly uh, protected so that the client doesn't lose their benefits. So not every client is going to need the type of planning that I'm talking about in this portion of the presentation. It's those that are disabled and receiving government benefit programs that require this type of planning, which is SSI and Medicaid recipients, uh, Medicare beneficiaries, which are MSA, the MSA issue that Rasa addressed, and those that are dual eligible that get both Medicare and Medicaid. 
So I'm gonna take some time to address one and then touch on three since Rasa already covered two. But it's important uh, to keep this acronym in mind and we've used a couple acronyms in today's presentation. This one is an important one when it comes to government benefits. It's read. So first, review your client's benefits at intake and throughout the case. You really need to have a process when you intake a case to identify the government benefit programs. Because as Raza talked about, if it's Medicare, there are issues. If it's Medicaid and SSI, there are issues. And making sure that you know throughout the representation if the client situation changes. Sometimes they might start out on Medicaid, they transition over to Medicare, uh, or if they're on Medicare, they might transition to a Medicare Advantage plan, which we also talked about the potential implications for liens. So it's really important across all aspects to make sure that you've got a process at intake to review what benefits are, are at issue in that particular case. Enlisting experts, something we've talked about. Um, award letters are, are really important. So getting a copy of the Medicaid award letter, the Social Security award letter, Medicare, if they've got it, having that. And then also documenting your file ultimately on what the client decides to do after they've gotten educated upon all these issues. And if they decide that they don't wanna keep their government benefits, which is something that clients can decide uh, to do and just self pay or get private insurance, make sure you document your file and, and have something on file that shows they were educated and made that decision with all the, the possible information at, at their fingertips. All right, so I wanted to, to go through the basics of Medicaid and SSI so everybody has that because it's important on the issue spotting and then also to talk about the types of planning that's necessary for those that receive those benefits. So both Medicaid and SSI are income and asset sensitive. SSI is cash assistance for those 65 or older, blind or disabled. The maximum SSI payment is $7.94 a month if you're single, 11, uh, I think it's 1915 uh, currently for uh, those that are married. I've got a typo in that, so I apologize. Um, for SSI, unlike Social Security Disability, there's no requirement to have work sufficient uh, quarters or anything like that. Basically, it's based on the factors of the, the age bracket, blind or disabled, and financial need. So this SSI is an asset cap of $2,000 if you're single, $3,000 if you're married, plus an income cap. So you have to be cognizant of that. So for example, because it's got an income cap, if you didn't give the client any money, but you set up a structured settlement, you don't have an asset cap problem, but you have an income cap problem. For Medicaid, it's just the basic healthcare coverage for the indigent. In most states, $1 of SSI automatically gives you Medicaid coverage. And that's an important thing to understand because if a client is okay with losing their SSI because say they're receiving a very small amount, well, that means that they may in fact lose their Medicaid at the same time. So if they can't independently qualify for Medicaid, that's just caused them to lose all of their healthcare coverage. So you gotta be careful. So if a client is on Medicaid and SSI and is disabled, that's a situation where a special needs trust should be considered as part of the planning for that personal injury settlement. Because if assets are in the name of a person with a disability, then that would eliminate eligibility for SSI and Medicaid. In the month they get the settlement, it is counted as income and it is counted as a resource the next day of the following month, which means ongoing ineligibility if nothing is done. So I've already talked about this, this issue of loss of SSI, so you've gotta be keenly aware of the fact that most clients won't mind losing SSI, but they'll also lose the Medicaid simultaneously if they've qualified for Medicaid through that benefit. So I wanted to talk about the solutions for clients that are disabled and on needs-based government benefits. So the, the primary mechanism that's utilized is special needs trusts. That's the, 
42 USC 1396 BD4 uh, statute I referenced earlier about the obligation to advise clients. There's two different types of trust. There's a D4A, which is a standalone. There is a uh, D4C that is a pool trust. The only difference between the two is that D4A trust can only be established for someone that's disabled and under the age of 65, whereas a pool trust can be established for someone disabled at any age. The only other uh, special needs trust that arises in the context of settlements periodically are third party. And these are trusts that are established with monies that are not the injury victim. So for example, where this can come up is um, the community does a fundraiser for someone that's disabled, that money would not go into a D4A or D4C, which is what we call a first party trust, because that's the monies that are the injury victims. Instead, the third party trust is established with those monies, or sometimes in a situation where a, a birth injury occurs, mom and dad may have assets they wanna leave that disabled child, they don't wanna leave it in a D4A trust that's set up for the settlement because the D4A trust and the D4C trust have what's called a payback provision, which means at, med at death, Medicaid has a right to reach into the trust corpus and recover monies that they've expended during lifetime. So you don't wanna put at risk monies that you don't have to, the third party trusts don't have that payback. So that's why the third party trusts are sometimes utilized in these personal injury settlements. So the advantages of establishing a, a trust is primary one is keeps those benefits intact. Having a professional trustee generally is better for the family. It allows them to concentrate on taking care of their family member, have the financial affairs dealt with, make sure that the uh, rules that regulate these government assistance programs are not violated because making a mistake there could destroy the whole the whole reason that you set up the trust in the first place, which was to keep the benefits intact. Um, you know, in, in most states, it avoids guardianships in the annual reports, although that can uh, can vary by jurisdiction. And then these trusts can pay for nearly anything except food or shelter. And food and shelter is really only an issue if someone is receiving SSI. The disadvantages of, of the trust are that it does not allow the client unrestricted use of the funds. It's not like they have their own checkbook. So the, the trust does have rules and limitations. And one of those is the sole benefit rule, which basically means the trust can only be used for the sole benefit of the injury victim, which oftentimes is a good thing because it makes sure that others can't take advantage of that injury victim, uh, but it also in family situations can create a tough uh, dynamic because the trust can't be used to support other family members. And I mentioned this a moment ago, at death, Medicaid does have this right of reimbursement. Uh, that's mandated by federal law. If the trust doesn't have that provision, the client's money is not going to be exempt from being countable. So every special needs trust has this provision. The exception are the third party trusts. And then these trusts have to be irrevocable. So you know, once it's done, it's done. It's not something that can be undone. One thing that is really important uh, in, in cases that arises frequently is a problem called deeming. And what that means is if you have a situation, say, where you've got a settlement for a minor child, the minor is on Medicaid, and mom and dad have a consortium claim, you give mom and dad $100,000 for the consortium claim, the minor's money goes into a special needs trust, everybody thinks it's great, uh, minor's money is protected, Medicaid's protected, that's wrong. So because of deeming, mom and dad's consortium recovery of 100 grand disqualifies the minor child. The money they have is deemed to the minor child. Same thing between husband and wife. So you've got to be really careful in those cases to construct the settlement in such a way that you don't cause an issue. Uh, and there's creative ways to deal with that, but you've got to make sure you address those issues or you would have a big problem on your hands, even though you thought you did all the things right and correctly. Exempt assets are also 
uh, a great way of avoiding the whole trust issue altogether. And what I mean by that is a Medicaid recipient can spend down the money they receive if it's a smaller amount or even if it was $100,000 on exempt assets. For example, you could spend 100 grand and buy a house, that's an exempt asset. As long as you do it within the same calendar month, Medicaid eligibility is not interrupted. That's a spend down. You have to be careful with that though, because if they're getting SSI, then if you try to do a spend down, it will impact SSI. So you really have to consult with experts to make sure that what you're doing overall makes sense. But there are a lot of things that are exempt assets. So in some instances, a special needs trust will buy a lot of those exempt assets, buy a house, buy a car. That's a that's one of the other primary exempt assets. Uh, so you know, good things to know and understand, or at least have a basic understanding uh, of because it's it, it potentially solves some of the problems that frequently arise if a client doesn't want to set up a trust then spend down might be an appropriate solution but you want to make sure you get proper advice i wanted to touch on pool trust real briefly because they're used very frequently in personal injury settlements because they are different from standalone trusts in that they have a not-for-profit under federal law that establishes an access trustee of the trust which means that they don't have a minimum deposit. Most banks and trust companies that uh, administer special needs trusts have large minimum deposit requirements, 500,000, a million. Pool trusts don't. They'll take a trust any size because it is run by a not-for-profit. Also, the, the pool trust, as I mentioned, doesn't have the age restriction. So if you've got someone elderly, a pool trust is gonna be the only viable option, but there are some state-to-state -state issues with transfer penalties, so you got to be careful with that. Um, with a pool trust, the trust beneficiary joins an already established trust, so it's simpler. There's not a need for a complex uh, planning process and drafting of a new special needs trust, and they just join the pool trust with what's called a joinder, so it's a major advantage over special needs trust. Typically, the fees are going to be lower and they can accept the smaller trusts, which are really beneficial. When you're evaluating trust options, you want to make sure that you've got a not for profit trustee that understands personal injury settlements. A lot of pool trusts are uh, established by not for profits who really focus on dealing with the elderly, which is great, but it's a different population, different needs. Um, you want to make sure that the client is going to get the, the right services because some trusts will employ things like um, different services for managing the recovery and using the benefits. One, one example is TrueLink. They're a national provider. Uh, they manage pool trust assets, and they also have a smart credit card that allows injury victims to use the money in their trust very easily, which is a great thing for the injury victim. Teams is a service that allows family members to be caregivers, but yet get access to uh, workers' comp coverage, group health, have proper uh, taxes withheld, and basically become an employee of the trust. You want to look at their fee structure and also at death. Many pooled trusts will retain 100% of the money is left over. Uh, because that's allowed under federal law if the money that is in the trust is less than is uh, due to Medicaid for their payback, right? But many pool trusts don't retain 100%, so you've got to compare that because that's an important important thing to, to know and understand. Uh, one option that's a really great option as typically an add-on is ABLE accounts. It is limited because you can only use these if the injury victim became disabled prior to age 26. You can contribute a certain amount annually, 15,000 um, to these plans. And if they're on SSI, you cannot put more than $100,000. But what's nice about this is that these accounts can be used to pay for food and shelter and other disability related expenses. But it, it, it does have a Medicaid payback like trusts but the advantage is that there's less limitations on how the funds can be used. A lot of times these are used in conjunction with a special needs trust 
or a structured settlement. So it's just another planning tool that can be used for the injury victim. So I, I, I wanted to touch on this, even though Raza talked about Medicare set-asides, what's important to understand is if you have a client who gets Medicaid and Medicare, that Medicare set-aside, if it's established, is countable for purposes of qualifying for Medicaid. So there's some extra planning that, that has to occur in that instance. So the way this works is that if somebody is on Medicare and Medicaid, Medicare is actually primary in that. Medicaid will pay co-pays and deductibles and Part D expenses, all the things that Medicare doesn't cover. So for injury victims, basically it covers almost everything. So it's a really uh, you know, great setup for covering all that if the client wants to continue with that coverage. If they do though, the extra step is that that Medicare set aside has to be inside of a special needs trust wrapper. And basically all that means is that you have a special needs trust with some special Medicare language. And typically you have two different trusts because you wanna segregate the Medicare funds from the non-Medicare funds. But it's an important note to, to know that in those instances, you can't just set up an, an MSA and then have an SNT for the Medicaid funds. That MSA has to be put inside of an SNT wrapper. So last topic is qualified settlement funds and commonly referred to as QSFs. I wanted to touch upon this at the end because you know, frequently there is a time crunch at the end of a case. You want to get the case settled. You want to get the money from the defendant. Uh, you want to make sure that um, ultimately the client gets advised and that can really cause a time crunch. Here, uh, if you implement a QSF, it gives some breathing room and space. And there's there's a couple of classic situations that really lend itself to using a qualified settlement fund. First is if you've got multiple claimants and you have allocation issues between the parties, QSF is a perfect situation for that. If you have multiple layers of coverage and you want to aggregate settlement amounts together, so for example, if you've got you know, a, a catastrophically injured client, first layer of coverage is half a million dollars, they tender it, but there's a million excess and 10 million after that, you may not want to do anything with that first half uh, a million because you don't know what the total recovery is gonna be. If you've got some of the lien resolution issues that were talked about today, public benefit planning issues I talked about, structured settlements, whether it's the injury victim or you want to avail yourself of attorney fee deferral. These are all great situations for uh, utilizing a QSF. And really all a QSF is, it's a temporary trust that acts as a holding tank for a settlement and it's done pursuant to treasury regulations. And it's 1.468B is the treasury regulation if you wanna look it up. Basically, the, these QSFs were originally utilized primarily in mass tort settlements where a defendant wanted to settle with a class of plaintiffs, dumped all the money into a fund. There's no limitation though on these being utilized for just mass torts and they're frequently used for cases with one or more claims because that's what the language of the regulation says. And the, the trust, when the money is deposited into it, gives breathing room space. You execute a cash release with the defendant, the money gets dumped into the, into the QSF, fees and costs can be taken out immediately if they're not going to be structured or deferred, but yet all of these different other issues can be discussed, the client can be fully informed, all while avoiding that triggering of constructive receipt that I talked about. The only drawback is that these have to be created by a court order, so there's some additional time and expense, but it is relatively small. So in terms of the mechanics of this, you settle uh, for uh, what is really a cash settlement. You, you do a cash release, except the consideration in the release is payment to the qualified settlement fund, the settlement check, 
uh, all of it is typically put into the QSF, although you could have a scenario where fees and costs were paid separate before it went into the QSF. You petition a court, and it doesn't have to be the court that has jurisdiction over the matter, it's any court, and obtain an order creating the QSF. The funds remain in the QSF without triggering constructive receipt until all those allocation decisions are made, liens resolved, special needs trusts or MSA are created, uh, deciding upon whether amounts are going to be structured or not. And then once all of that's done, the QSF terminates uh, and, and that's at the point where all the funds have been dispersed. So pretty simple, but a really neat and effective tool. Uh, so that's my contact information. If you've got any questions about the presentation today, um, as all of us do, we constantly consult with trial lawyers to make sure that you know, we're, we're providing value and service to you guys. Uh, last point, uh, that's a picture from our last in-person meeting, which has been a little bit of time now due to COVID, unfortunately, and hoping that we're going to have a, a time soon where we can all get together. But that team is an incredible team focused on our singular mission, which is improving the lives of the catastrophically injured. And we at Synergy view every case as an opportunity to improve a life. And that team is focused on that mission. And everybody on this call today uh, is a believer and a true believer in that mission and works tirelessly to make sure ultimately your client is protected, which is all, you know, the, the focus of today's presentation is really all about putting more money into your client's pocket through lien resolution or protecting their benefits and protecting that financial recovery, which Rasa and I talked about. So thank you for participating today. And I think now I'm turning back over to Dan for Q&A. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> um, yeah, great picture. I look forward to us being able to do that again uh, sometime soon. Uh, we have a handful of questions that have been submitted. Um, I'll run through them. I think there's still time if you wanted to submit an additional question, we could address that live as well. So I'll jump right in. Uh, question one, when we have related bills that do not appear on the lien claims log, are we required to report this information? So that sounds like it would be a me question. Um, it's, it's a tricky question. There are some lien holders who almost force this on you. They put it in their letter when they send you the itemization that if there is something that you know should be here and it's not here, then they're basically giving you a duty to let them know. Um, if you were not to let them know in that situation, then you've got a bigger fight on your hands when that shows up at your door later. On the other hand, there's some lien holders that aren't quite as savvy and they don't have that wording. And it's my position, especially having come from that side, that it's their job to build their lien. And if for whatever reason they're not building it appropriately, that shouldn't be your job to say, hey, don't you mean that this extra $100,000 bill should be on here so that we can fight you on the reimbursement part of it? So it really depends. It's um, My answer is often it depends, but I will give you both sides and then you can decide from there. Thanks, Teresa. I think this is another one for you. Um, when you get a chance, can you address the problem that happens when a company like Rawlings sends a copy of the lien payment history directly to the BI or UM carriers, who in turn then send it to us? This can affect our ability to handle and ultimately negotiate a maximum settlement. This practice feels like it's interference with our cases, and I would like to know what the lien companies think they are doing with this practice as they might be hurting themselves. Anyways, thanks for any thoughts. Yes, so that is a lien holder's attempt to subrogate. So um, there's a, a different legal theory with subrogation versus reimbursement. Subrogation is essentially standing in the shoes of the actual injured party and going directly to the tortfeasor or the person who should be paying for those losses. So when a company like Rawlings or Optum goes directly to Geico and provides them their claim statement, they're saying, here's my injury, pay me. Um, and there's been a big push at some of these um, subrogation vendors to do just that to try to sidestep the attorney to make sure that they are getting even um, that they're getting their full reimbursement now the good news is most of these insurance carriers don't fall for it but you've probably come across a couple that that have that are scared by the words that are in their letter um, your pushback to that is that there's no case law that allows them to do that so it's a huge gray space um, with this whole idea of 
a health plan subrogating. Um, it is in a lot of these policy languages that will say that they can subrogate, which means go directly to the tortfeasor, or they can seek reimbursement, which means going to the injured party once the settlement funds are received by them. Um, so in yes, they are interfering. It can definitely cause problems. Um, but from their position, their thought is that they are protecting their rights and they're cutting out the possibility of needing to reduce by having conversations with you. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, can Michael address the issue with hospitals that will charge $13,000 for each body part for CT scans? They'll scan four or five or more body parts. This leads to total ER bills for standard auto MVA care in case of excess of $70,000. Thank you. Michael, yeah. I assume you have a word or two on that. Yeah, CT scans are, are a very common problem that folks face. Um, they are the principal inflator of these hospital bills. As you all know, client goes into the ER and they leave with three or four scans just as door prizes, um, whether they need them or not, it seems. I don't know, you know they, if it's a function of defensive medicine or what. But it's an issue, uh, especially because CT scan charges are the most egregiously inflated themselves of any other charges on the bill. When I see the average CT scans that I look at, the cost of care, and again, this is self-reported cost, the hospital reports this themselves to the federal government under oath. And interestingly, the CT scan departments, the only thing that comes out of them are CT scans. So this cost data is even more accurate on a departmental level. Um, and, and it's usually under 2% cost. So over 98% profit in those charges. So not only is there overutilization generally across the board, but as this uh, questioner asked, it, what about when they give you five scans of different body parts? Is, is that legit? Um, it is something that I've pushed back on in litigation a few times, unfortunately never do these hospitals let me get very far in that litigation? They typically settle pretty quickly, especially when you start digging into CT scans because it is a tremendous revenue center for them. And I know that they know that they have tremendous exposure because their costs are so low, their charges are so high, their overutilization is so obvious. Um, I have always taken the position, and it sounds like this, this attorney does as well, that that is a little fishy. Um, and from a regular operational standpoint, my understanding in most cases, when you see five different views and they're listed as different line items and different scans, the reality is they're run through the machine once or sometimes twice, but they run through the machine once and then they can pull these different views. So how is that, that it's not duplicative to bill five times for that one scan where you had one tech take them up to the, to the room, ran them through the machine once, at least the majority of the time and service is duplicated in each of those $5,000 charges. So yes, it is something to push back on, uh, as are the prices in general of CT scans. Gotcha. Um, Ross, this one is for you. Does the method of payment for past medical expenses, LOP, cash, health insurance, have any bearing on whether a Medicare recipient needs to create an MSA? Thank you, Dan. So the method of payment really is only going to be relevant in trying to decide whether the settlement is sufficient to fund future medical. So if you have a situation where Medicare is making the payments, the conditional payment amount is going to be significantly lower than what a straight up hospital provider or other medical provider might be seeking if they're trying to pursue recovery from the settlement. Uh, conditional payment is just for the sake of argument, usually 30 cents on the dollar. So if you have a conditional payment situation that you must address from the settlement, it's quite likely that the settlement might be sufficient to fund future medicals. So the relevance really is only going to factor in when we're talking about what is the net to the client. Thank you. Um, Jason, what are the costs associated with setting up a special needs trust if I have a case where a disabled client is getting 5K net, does it make sense to set up a special needs trust? Great question. So it does vary. So no, no straight across the board answer. For a pool trust, it could be as little as two grand startup, uh, sometimes even less in terms of expense. You know, typically there is an elder law attorney that is doing some of the legal work because when you set up a special needs trust, 
you have to send the trust to Medicaid and Social Security if, if they're on both those benefits for review. So you want to ultimately uh, make sure that you've got somebody that's doing that work. So that's why typically trial lawyers don't do that. You know, smaller net settlements are probably going to lend themselves to a spend down plan, which I mentioned. Five grand is is likely, uh, you know, too small for it to be viable to put into a special needs trust. A, a pool trust will accept a trust that small, but the question would be, you know, whether the expenses to create it really truly justify uh, establishing it versus just spending it down at that point. I had a lien company that sent me a lien for a certain amount, but when I tried to get an updated one, I never got a response or an updated lien. The case settled and the original amount was sent to the company, but they would not accept it and sent back uh, a letter for another amount. What should happen now? Certainly not the first time we've heard this fact pattern. Yeah, definitely. Um, tricky situation. Um, so what should happen now? Um, you've got a fight on your hands, essentially. Um, their pushback is going to be that you didn't request a final lien amount unless you did and that's what they didn't respond to so hopefully that request was in writing because that would be your um, initial response is this is the last amount that i received from you i requested a final lien amount prior to settlement you didn't respond so i had to rely on the information that you had previously provided um, if that request was by voicemail or a verbal and they just never sent it then the trickier because it's not in writing. Um, so that's where having you know a, a written trail can definitely be helpful. Um, so they're going to put their heels in the ground, no doubt, especially if that amount is significantly higher. And that often does happen where you might have a lien of $3,000 and then you settle the case and all of a sudden now it's $30,000. They, they want their money, right? So, um, so big, big fight to push, but um, put up the good fight. That's my advice. Thanks. And the last question we have submitted, um, what if you receive the conditional payment letter from CMS, but you know it does not include all of the applicable charges, the opposite of what I usually face? Do you agree that I have an obligation to advise CMS of charges that are related slash I've claimed to the defendants, but CMS has not picked up yet? Yeah, we often get this um, as well on the, on the Medicare lien side. Um, so Medicare, similar to all the other lien holders they they select the claims right like they decide what goes into um, their asserted claim there are some times that they cannot collect on certain claims and that might be why it's not included um, this, but this ends up becoming just a big mystery so what you should do is send a fax to medicare and advise them the specific dates of treatment that are indeed related that aren't on their summary so the opposite of what I would maybe say with some of those other lien holders. Um, but even then, we've had this situation a number of times. Even then, sometimes Medicare will not add them on. But at least then, you have your written documents that indicate that you asked them to do it, they sent you something else, and it still didn't include it. That's your due diligence. You've, you've at least taken the proper steps, and you've got something to stand behind. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks. Thanks. Go ahead, Rasa. Which is to, to that point, sometimes you might also have a situation where there are two different policies that are going to be making payment in connection with one claim. So if you have the one demand letter from CMS that doesn't include something, you might very well find it claimed in that subsequent conditional payment demand that is coming from the other settlement. Good spot. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists uh, for your time and expertise. Thank you um, for everyone that attended. We appreciate you sharing the time with us. Hope you learned some things that are useful in your practice. Most importantly, we hope we've learned the, earned the opportunity um, to be a partner in representing the families that you represent. Again, my email is dan at synergysettlements.com if you'd like to learn more about working with Synergy or schedule a customized onboarding uh, meeting. We'd love to do that with you and learn the more efficient way to begin to partner. And um, any questions at all, dan at synergysettlements.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.